So we're staying in France for our last film, a film we have in fact covered on this before, but that was in 2017, the before times. So <laughs> the way you calculate this is like you take anything from before March this year and add 45 years and you have roughly how long ago anything happened. <laughs> Yes, uh, we're talking, of course, about Ma Vie de Courgettes, or My Life as a Courgette, or I believe that would be. As you say, we spoke about this back in our intermission episode back in July 2017, so I may not give this the, well, I'll give this an even more hastily abridged version than normal, but we liked it very much back then, and at the risk of spoiling the results of this review, nothing has happened in the intervening years to make me reconsider that opinion. Yes, in which, uh, taken into a children's home after accidentally killing his drunken layabout mother, Icar, preferring to be called Courgette, struggles to fit in alongside his fellow children uh, that the world has already damaged in various heartrending ways. However, an already disrupted life is further be turmoiled when Camille arrives and steals Courgette's heart. Metaphorically, it's not literally heartrending. Claude Barras has picked an interesting and unique style for this film's animation, perhaps most closely resembling the drawings that the film's subjects make make themselves, but of course, rather more beautifully realised. And as you mentioned earlier, uh, rather like Mary and Max, it is, despite its style, ploughing some very dark places for themes and comes out much the stronger for it, particularly when leavened with a great deal of humour and humanity. And stop me if you've heard this one before, but this is a really good film and I recommend it highly. <laughs> Yes, uh, really, really enjoyable stuff and happy to come visit this one again. Drew, do you have anything in particular to add that we've not said already? No, um, first of all, it's like sometimes we engineer these episodes simply to discover things. <laughs> in this case, everything apart from the first two I selected for this podcast because I knew they were good. Uh, <laughs> the whole point of this episode is that I love stop motion animation. Or we love stop motion animation. So yeah. I wanted to give good examples. Um, the Wild Card was... A Midsummer Night's Dream. Mm -hmm. uh, and you already liked the Ray Harryhausen style, which is the case of which film we talked about turned out to be one that was actually surprisingly just enjoyable as a, a good adventure yarn. As for this, we're, we're finishing on a kind of a downer note in terms of like the content, but it's just, I think the technically this is perhaps one of the, the lesser ones um, because it's a fairly standard claymation um, but there's a lot of expressiveness in the over large heads and the big large eyes yeah. big large great grammar big large <laughs> um, the big large not small eyes um, <laughs> and it still, it still looks great um, this film's particular strength actually though is not so much the animation the animation is just a I think I, one of the strengths of animation, and not just stop motion, is that it kind of lowers your defences, so you can actually have something like much more hard hitting, yeah, and not really be expecting and be more effective for that, yeah. And this is certainly one of those cases. Uh, this film's real strength is its script, written by Celine Sciamma, who we talked about just recently in, with Tomboy, yeah, and it has that same sort of gentle dealing of childhood and potential childhood traumas and difficulties. This one, the the actual difficulties in face by children are, are way beyond what's in Tomboy. But it has that same sort of careful, gentle touch to it, which is really, really good. Uh, it's visually the, probably the least remarkable of the ones we're talking about, but it has a distinctive style as well. And yeah, it's just, no less charming for all of that, yeah. No, absolutely not. It, it's, just, it's just nice. Um, it's actually also... Remarkably short, it's only 66 minutes. Um, yeah. Although I was curious about this and did check this. That does count as a feature film. The, <laughs> both the BFI and AFI say anything over 40 minutes is a feature, or it's maybe even 35, uh, I think 40. The, <laughs> there's a French um, organisation that says it's anything over, I think, 55 minutes is a feature, which is fine because the French invented cinema, so I reckon they get to have the biggest say. Um, <laughs> and it's only the Screen Actors Guild who says that anything over 75 minutes is a as we say, over 75 minutes for feature, but I suspect that's probably a negotiating tactic or something to do with pay <laughs> or something like that. Um, so definitely a feature. But, uh, yeah, it's it's charming and lovely. It's gentle and kind and one of those really good animations that seem to kind of understand childhood. Yeah. Like, and the, the simple interactions between children when they're alone in a way that doesn't feel like it's an adult guessing how that would go or anything or not misremembering. It, it, yeah. It feels right. Whether it not being a child anymore because that happened in the before before times um 
it's a little dim and distant memory now, but it feels right. It feels like it's not forced and it's not a misinterpretation or like rose tinted glasses or anything. It, f- it feels just kind of just right for how the children go and like. Um, and there's some wonderful bits of humour too, like the misunderstanding of, of how sex works and things, and yeah. the, the fear that their teacher um, might have his um, wiener explode. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lovely film. I, I recommend every one of these films in this podcast. So watch them all. That's your your well your duty, frankly. <laughs>